Okay. Green light, Tom, it should be green on both those down there too. Or just off. Thank you. You're live. Yeah. So any questions about anything before we get started? So who's taking notes? Several? Okay. okay. Questions? We'll take a video on that. <coughs> Kelly, did you get the slides okay? Yeah, I did, thank you. And for anybody on the NASA side that wants to get a hold of them, they are up on SharePoint now. Seeing the slides, uh, hearing the presenters, you know, 
please don't hesitate to speak up and let us know so we can correct that as soon as possible. Uh, so to go ahead and get started, uh, this is our critical design review. So uh, of course we appreciate any feedback or comments uh, during the presentation or at the end of the presentation for the concerns that we have about our current path. So just to get started, uh, you know, yesterday was the day of remembrance. Uh, for all the astronauts who uh, lost their lives and they had the call of duty. Uh, so we'd like to just kind of take a moment to remember the importance of what we're doing and why we're doing this here. And of course, appreciate everyone on the NASA side um, you know, dedicating all that you do. So this is our uh, schedule where we currently stand, uh, the CDR, and for the rest of the semester. Uh, we do have a planned visit probably at, sometime in April uh, down to one of the NASA sites. I don't think we've nailed down yet whether we're going to be going to JSC or Marshall this year. So we'll be in communication with you um, in the coming weeks uh, to finalize our plan for that. Uh, this semester we do have four courses that are working on the project. Uh, most of them are represented here today. We have the Aerospace Engineering Senior Design or Capstone course the Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering Capstone course, um, the Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering Controls and Instrumentation course, uh, and then last but not least, our Architectural and Architectural Engineering uh, Studio slash Space Engineering Architecture course. Uh, just a quick comment on the outreach that we're performing uh, this year. Uh, two of our team members on the aerospace engineering side spent a good deal of time working on this last semester, uh, Jessica and Kelsey, uh, in cooperation with our NASA education program here for um, AgCAS, uh, which is an agriculture community college aerospace scholars. Uh, so this will uh, be kicked off uh, sometime in February uh, for the students to work on projects which will be due in May. And as per the National NASA Education Office requests, these are focused on community college programs. If you'd like more information on that, it's available on the website. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, Kelly, I know you have a request on student profiles, and I'll be happy to send you this information later. Uh, this is not finalized, uh, so once I get the final details, I'll send you all of it. This is kind of give you a breakdown of the diversity of the students working on the project uh, this semester. Uh, there are about equal parts aerospace and biosystems and ag engineering students um, with a, a number of other students in, uh, thrown in from architectural engineering and electrical and computer uh, engineering. Uh, with that, I will be turning the presentation over to Kelsey. All right, so for today, for our agenda, we're going to start out introducing our team. Uh, we're also going to go over some of our main assumptions that we've made uh, when we started uh, designing this habitat. We'll then launch into our space rated design and talk about the entry, descent, and landing of it, as well as the deployment and the systems. Uh, we'll then go into the risk assessment for our design and finish up with our plans for our Earth analog and our testing. <coughs> All right, so this is a current picture of our team. Uh, we have about 25 students overall. Uh, like Dr. Jacob said, we have we represent four different majors. Uh, from this team, we also have separated ourselves into several different sub-teams. Uh, we have the space area design, deployable structures, uh, systems engineering, avionics, greenhouse systems, test and verification, and then finally outreach. Uh, so anytime anyone's going to be speaking today, we'll have a picture of them before they start speaking, uh, have their name, as well as the sub-team that they are a part of. All right, so here's a list of our basic assumptions that we made. Uh, initially, when we were thinking about sizing, uh, we knew that we were going to use the SLS to size our design. Um, so we know the, uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit in the next coming slides. We also wanted to provide supplemental food uh, for four astronauts for a minimum mission of 500 days. And all of our resources, this includes our gases, our water, and our electricity, uh, will either be brought or be produced there on the surface of Mars and are not unlimited in our design. Oops, 
All right, so now we're going to get started on the space ray design, and I'm going to send it over to Eddie, uh, who is part, uh, who is the lead of the space ray system. Here we have um, our interplanetary craft plan. Uh, will, as you can see, it will be approximately 12.75 meters long. Um, here it is fitting inside the SLS platform 19 meter payload restrictions. Uh, mass will be predicted to be less than the limit of 100 tons. Um, the different sections are labelled, I'll review there. Here is a more precise breakdown of mass estimates for the separate systems in the XSAB module, uh, coming to a total of less than 6,500 kilograms. Okay, um, the space mission will start with a burn at low Earth orbit that will send the craft onto a run near each trajectory with Mars. Um, our predicted transit time is approximately 259 days, and the predicted path is shown up there. After the booster stage detaches, the inflatable heat shield will deploy. We're estimating that to have a diameter of about 15 meters. Um, we, we'll use air braking to reduce speed through several air braking passes to eventually drop the craft to a suborbital trajectory with a final entry velocity of approximately 3.5 kilometers per second. Once the module drops below hypersonic speeds, parachutes will deploy. The deceleration for the final descent before landing will be supplied by the retro thrust module. This will also give slight control over final landing site. Once landed, the module will detach an accelerator way, accelerator way similar to the sky crane used on Curiosity. Here is an image of the module just after landing before deployment. Here we have the green wings after they are deployed via inflation, also using the cables to keep them off of the ground, as well as drill down cast piles uh, coming out of the solid end caps once fully deployed. Here are the predicted rough dimensions of the central hub and green wings. Shown is a close-up showing the area where the green wings will be packed. Um, the total available packed volume per green wing is estimated at 0.25 meters cubed. And here it is what's inflated and deployed. Total available inflated volume inside each green wing is approximately 19 meters cubed. And now I'll pass over to Ariel Barnes for the deployable structure section. Shown on the screen is a conceptual view of our greenhouse. Um, we did some original uh, material research, and this was based on an article about a spacesuit designed for Mars. And then shortly after we did this research, we met with uh, David Cadogan at ILC Dover, and we found out that some of these materials we selected we didn't need, and uh, it cut back on our thickness. Here is, he has sent us several documents on the different materials of uh, another spacesuit that would be more applicable, as well as a, uh, as well as the ag pod that the University of uh, Colorado did. And then the image at the bottom of the screen shows how the layers will be arranged in the green wings. We will use a Z-fold packing technique to reduce the, the stress on the fabric. And we are going to use our cables not only to assist in the deployment, but to also assist in flight to keep the the green wings packed and secured to minimize friction wear. And in order to connect the rigid and inflatable structures, we are using a flange shown on the left that will be secured between the, uh, the, the hub and the wing shown on the right. And now I will pass it off to Kelsey Koo to 
talk more about deployable structures. Okay, so this is a brief outline of how our deployment process will work. <clears throat> we have a main uh, compressed air tank in the main hub, and it has uh, connections to the rest of the four grain wings. Uh, at the beginning of deployment, that compressed air from the tank will inflate the grain wings at constant pressure. We have tension, four tension cables on the outside of our grain wing. Um, they're attached to the solid end cap and also attached to the central hub. Um, this will, uh, these tension cables will allow us to have a controlled deployment. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, we'll be using a winch system uh, to make sure that our deployment will be uh, completely horizontal. All the lights and grow beds for plants and everything uh, on the interior will be internally deployed. And we, as soon as the green wing is fully inflated to its five meter length, uh, we will deploy the uh, microcast piles from the end cap at the end uh, to secure that, uh, to secure the green wing on the uh, end of, on the very end. Uh, next, we'll have the inflatable floor um, that will deploy on the inside. And finally, we decided that uh, it would be best for us to bring plants um, and plant them when the astronauts are there, uh, just because the, uh, the germination process is very critical. Um, it requires careful handling, and Jonathan will talk about that a little bit later as well. Uh, so these are our pressure and loading calculations for our green wing. Um, we wanted to make sure that our materials would be appropriate for the loading that it needs to take. Uh, so we calculated the different pressure stresses, the hoop stress and the axial stress, um, and the maximum of that was about 6.9 megapascals, um, which is definitely under our limit for veteran. Uh, we also estimated the force on the end cap as uh, about 240 kilonewtons. Um, this was used to size the tension cables on the outside. Uh, we also calculated wind loading. Originally, we thought that wind would be a huge problem for our structure. Um, however, when we calculated the actual wind loading, it was much, uh, it was much lower than we had originally thought uh, because the uh, air pressure on Mars is much lower than on Earth. Uh, so for the worst case scenario in a dust storm with maximum winds of 30 meters per second, we'd be looking at a total of 95 newtons um, exerted on, this, on one green wing. And then finally, we also calculated the maximum moment on the green wing, and this moment is without considering the tension cables and the uh, cast piles. Um, so this would be considered a worst case scenario, um, and we come just short of 1,100 kilonewton meters, um, which is also below our limits. So for our interior design, uh, we initially looked at basing this off of spacesuit dimensions. Uh, so. We wanted to be able, if there was some sort of accident or the green wing needed to be fixed and astronauts needed to be able to enter the green wing uh, with a spacesuit, we wanted it, we wanted astronauts to still be able to maneuver easily within our structure. Um, so using documents that we found uh, from JSC um, and using calculations from, uh, from the EMU design, we uh, calculated that as a minimum, we would need about a one meter wide floor. Um, so we decided to go with just over a one meter wide floor, and from there, uh, we decided the rest of our interior. So on either side of the floor, we have our uh, attachment, our attachment straps, which is where we're going to attach our plants and our lighting um, in our deployable structure. And I'll talk more about that in a few slides. These the tension, this diagram on the right shows where the tension cables will be placed on our structure. Uh, so we have four tension cables in total, um, two on the bottom, two on the top, and they line up with the critical structures on the inside. Um, the inflatable floor can also be seen there at the bottom. Um, it's going to be manufactured into the green wing tube itself. So this shows a side view of the end of our green wing. Um, you can see before the end cap, there's uh, all of our 
plants and systems on our uh, rack-based system. Um, this best illustrates where our microcast pile will be. Uh, so prior to deployment, the microcast pile be, will be inside the solid part of the end cap, and once the green wing is deployed, it will drill down into the Martian surface and provide an anchor. So this is our plan for the attachment straps, which is how we're going to mount all of our um, inside systems. Uh, so coming, there's straps that come from the ceiling down to the floor um, that have little loops in them. And those little loops uh, will use carabiner-like attachments to attach any type of systems to those. Uh, so for instance, in this picture, we have the LED light strips and the grow beds um, to show the relationship between those. Uh, the good thing about this system is that we can move anything at any time. Uh, so if the plants grow taller and we need to move the grow beds down, we can do that. Um, the other thing is if something, uh, if some accident occurs and uh, there's damage to one of the systems, they can be easily replaced. Also, if there needs to be access to the, uh, to the systems, uh, such as piping or pump systems or anything that happens behind, uh, behind these grow beds, the grow beds can be unhooked in the systems and you can have full access to those systems. All right, and finally, this is our exterior layout um, completely deployed, uh, very similar to our original concept that we showed earlier, um, but this is the more finished design. And now I'm going to pass it over to Zach and Systems Engineering. In order to support our initial inflation and continue to support the mission through its entire timeline, we selected the NASA Norse tank to provide our air pressure. It's going to be pressurized to about 41.4 megapascals. This uh, high pressure allows us to carry a high volume of air and it is going to be stored within just under a one meter by over a half meter uh, big. And the central hub upon launch is going to be pressurized so we only have to worry about pressurizing the wings and continuing to support the hub pressure and wing pressures. In order to figure out if our tank will be supported, we had to use Boyle's Law and uh, we know our pressure that we need to sustain within the wing, the volume of the wing, and the pressure inside the tank. So we were able to narrow down that we need 0.114 cubic meters of tank volume, and the Norse tank successfully almost doubles what we uh, need, so we are able to go through and iterate to find our leak rate. Uh, in order to support the mission successfully, we need to keep our leak rate just under 1.45 cubic meters per day. I'll now pass it over to Shane in order to continue the systems. Alright, uh, this is our deployment process. Um, just a quick uh, diagram on the screen. Uh, we'll give you a breakdown of what's going to happen. Uh, we're looking for constant pressure throughout the deployment. Uh, we want to keep everything pretty even uh, to reduce any, uh, any damage that can occur there. I want to be slow and controlled uh, to prevent structural failure due to rapid inflation. <coughs> Since it's going to be cold, um, as we get there, we're not going to have any systems warming up the greenhouse yet until after everything's deployed. Um, the greenhouse will inflate to its full pressure so that every, every, all the systems can get set and settled, and then one, as the green wing warms up, uh, air will either be diverted back into the tank, um, or if that becomes too complex or too troublesome, there are going to be uh, pressure relief valves on the end uh, so that as the air warms up and expands, um, we don't find any ruptures. Uh, anywhere. Um, so like, you, or like you can see uh, from the tank, it'll be open to the regulator or the control valve. Um, the pressure sensor will be attached there to monitor the rate at which uh, the air is being let out of the tank and the green wings. We want to keep it at a, uh, in a certain range uh, to prevent any damage or, uh, in that regard. And once we go into testing, we'll be exploring the best range to be inflating at. Uh, so then it goes into all four of the wings at the same time. Uh, as we begin exploring the inflation, uh, we realize we're just as important as inflating it. We need to be able to control how it's being inflated so it's not flailing around or dragging on the ground. Uh, so we initially um, 
you know, we, didn't, we didn't have anything in mind. Uh, we came up with the tension cable idea, but explored a couple other options as well. Uh, the two on the left, the collimation device and the compartmentalization techniques, those are both concepts by ILC Dover. Um, we decided not to go with either of those, um, particularly the collimation device, because the mandrel um, works really well on a high aspect ratio inflatable. Um, we liked it because it had a deformable seal that retards the inflation and prevents it from deploying out an angle, but our green wings uh, have such a low aspect ratio that it would prove to be pretty ineffective. Uh, we could get creative with it, but the tension cables were a lot simpler, uh, a lot easier to try to handle. The compartmentalization technique uh, is unique because it's staged the inflation process, but since we need to be moving through the green wing, uh, we didn't want to have any obstructions throughout that process. And the compartmentalization has, uh, you know, breaks down each section of the, the wing and adds a burst disc there, so it has to be sealed up um, prior to inflation, and we didn't want to have anything in the way there. Uh, so the tension cables, uh, we decided were the best, the best way to go. Uh, they can maintain rigidity during deployment. Uh, they can prevent rapid inflation um, by adding, adding brakes, uh, slow, slow the inflation down. Um, they'll keep the deployment process linear so you don't have the hubcap uh, falling down or falling backward on, or onto itself. Uh, so now I'll pass it off to Derek, and he's going to talk a bit more about the tension cables to give you guys a better idea. Okay, so the purpose of the tension cables um, is to control the green wing deployment. They're going to be in constant tension, and they will help the end caps maintain a perpendicular position with the surface of Mars uh, through deployment. Um, the cables will also provide structural reinforcement against winds, the outward pressure force coming from the wing, and will also provide floor support. Uh, we had to decide on the number of tension cables that we were going to use, and initially we had a, six cables around the green wing. Um, this was going to give us more attachment points for more control, but it also meant more weight. We then looked into four cables, um, as that would give us less weight, but it also meant less control. Uh, for material selection, we looked into steel cables and wires versus uh, fibrous materials. For the fibrous materials, Vectran is stronger than Kevlar, but uh, breaks under tension well before Kevlar. Um, and then Kevlar and steel have about the same tensile strength for their, uh, for their material. Um, but with the elements on Mars we just, and the exposure that they're going to see through the 500 days, we decided on uh, steel cables. Um, we're going with four steel cables per green wing. This will give us sufficient control as you only really need about three points of contact. Um, and this will also be a lot less weight than the six cable design. The steel we are using is a low relaxation wire that has a high breaking point of about 1.86 gigapascals. With this breaking point, we figured a six millimeter diameter cable would be sufficient for our mission. Uh, the wires will be attached to the end caps, as shown by the red circles on the right, um, and connected to a winch system which is mounted on the inner bulkhead around the pressure door in the inner pressure vessel. Uh, the vertical separation of the wires is about 2 meters, and the horizontal is just over 1 meter. Um, so the system that we have to control the uh, tension cables, uh, we went with like a winch system. There's going to be one winch per cable, so four winches per green wing. Uh, there's going to be, or the spool of the winch will be mounted inside the boxes, um, built into the pressure door bulkhead, as shown by the arrows on the right. Um, each winch is independently controlled, so no wires move in tandem, giving us more control of 
for your deployment. Each spool is going to have a counter um, of the amount of revolutions each spool has taken. And if one winch has a higher count than the other three for that wing, that means that section of the bulkhead is out in front of the others. And so we will correct for that through um, the system will halt movement of that uh, winch and allow for the others to catch up. Um, we'll have, the, when the count is equal for all four winches, uh, movement for that one will uh, resume. And uh, the picture in the bottom left is your common winch, and that will kind of give you an idea of what we're designing for. Uh, for this system. And next I'll hand it over to Jonathan for greenhouse systems. Uh, as we discussed previously, we selected an aeroponic system uh, to go forward with our design work. And we selected this system based on its potential for increased productivity as well as the low water requirements with respect to some more traditional uh, hydroponic methods. So moving forward from last time, we selected lettuce, spinach, carrots, onions, cucumbers, radish, snap peas, strawberries, and blackberries. We selected these plants based on their yield, water needs, nutrient needs, maintenance needs, as well as their growth temperature. Uh, so to kind of help visualize these characteristics, we created what we call a resource viability index, or the RVI. So in, in this index, we assign scores from one to five, with five being the most viable score. And uh, basically, we consider anything above three to be a fairly viable op option. So taking the plants we selected, we took the average of their score in each category and created a group RVI to characterize our group. And so you can see here that all our scores are above three, which implies that our selections are uh, a viable group. So now I'll go into some more of the details about the actual aeroponic system design. Uh, so I'll talk about the schematic, how we handle the nutrient solution, how we handle germination, and then our planning schedule and crop rotation. Uh, so this is a basic overall schematic of our design. Uh, as you can see, it's a partially closed loop, so we try to reuse as much nutrient solution in water as possible, uh, which reduces our initial needs for water and nutrient solution uh, to transport from Earth to Mars. Uh, so for our nutrient solution, we selected a two-part uh, solution that's produced by Sensi Bloom. It has part A, which consists of cations, and part B, which consists of anions. Uh, so to monitor our nutrient solution, we can uh, measure the pH, and based on the pH value, we know whether we need to add cations or anions. Uh, so to, to distribute our nutrient solution out to the aeroponic tubes, we'll be using a bladder tank, uh, and we'll store the, the nutrient solution at 689 kilopascals. That's around 100 psi. Uh, these bladders will be placed at the end of each green wing, uh, and since they're pressurized, we can actually allow a manual relief valve. Uh, so in the case of a systems failure, uh, instead of letting the roots dry out, which takes about an hour to two hours, depending on the plant, our astronauts will be able to go in there and manually release the valve to try to keep water on the roots uh, until the problem is resolved. And as we monitor our nutrient solution, we will be looking at the electroconductivity and the pH. Uh, so this gives us a basic idea of the composition. Uh, electric conductivity tells us about the salt levels in the solution, and the pH tells us uh, where we are with respect to anions and cations. So in this uh, graph in the lower right, you can see that we have the nutrient availability to the plants based on pH for uh, these different nutrients that are needed. And so what we found is we can optimize uh, nutrient availability between a pH of 5.8 and 6.3. Uh, so we want to maintain our pH in between these values to ensure that our plants can utilize it. And in order to reduce the required volume of clean water, uh, we'll be trying to reclaim as much water from the system as possible. Uh, so we'll be condensing water from the green wing atmosphere and recollecting it into our water tank. And then when our nutrient solution is too high in salt content, we'll be using reverse osmosis uh, to filter out the water and our treated water will go back to the stock water supply and the brine will be removed from the system and disposed accordingly. And so to most effectively recirculate our nutrient solution, uh, what we want to do is we, we collect the runoff in our uh, drainage collection tank, and we'll measure the electroconductivity 
uh, and the pH. And so if the electroconductivity is higher than the max allowable salt content, we will t send it to the reverse osmosis system. But if it's still lower, uh, we'll send it to a disinfection tank and then we'll, uh, we'll mix it back in with the mixing tank where we'll measure pH and electroconductivity and add water and nutrients as necessary. Uh, so what this does is it allows us to reduce the initial nutrient solution input. Uh, and so now I'll talk a little about germination. Uh, what we decided to do was use uh, in-system pads that we can plant the seeds in. So this allows us to do our initial germination in the system. So there's no need for transplanting seedlings from a, a germination chamber to the system. Uh, this would reduce the man hours needed uh, to properly maintain our system. Uh, it also makes it a little easier for the astronauts. And so for our plant rotation, uh, we, we group the plants by their temperature requirements. And so as you can see here in wing one, we'll have onion, cucumbers, and peas. In wing two, we'll have lettuce and carrots. In wing three, we'll have spinach and radish. And in wing four, we'll have strawberries and blackberries. And we'll maintain these wings in the temperature optimal for the plants in them. And then as we, we set up a planting schedule, we wanted to optimize both the productivity and the space utilization. Uh, so what we did is we went through and we set a number of plants we desired for each year, for each plant. And then we, uh, we took the time to maturity and we calculated a planting interval. And so after the first plant comes to maturity, the planting interval will also be the harvest interval. Uh, so you can see here, we have a planting interval of, for example, with snap peas. Uh, two, every two days we'll plant one snap pea. And then after uh, the 60 days from the first planting, we'll harvest snap peas every two days as well. Uh, so this was a good way to optimize the production of our system. Uh, and when we calculated these, we assumed a death rate of 40%, which is relatively high death rate for, for crops. Um, so we should have some excess, hopefully. Uh, and then for strawberries and blackberries, they're continually fruiting plants. Uh, so it was a little harder to calculate a planting interval. So we just decided to plant four of each and allow them to, to be collected as a, uh, as a fruit. I'll now hand it over to Connor Beck, and then he will discuss uh, power systems. Okay, so <clears throat> power generation is obviously very important to our greenhouse design. Our design uses a hybrid system using both rigid and flexible solar cells. The rigid solar cells, as you can see, are mounted along the side of the hub, and they deploy out when the green wings extend, and then solar panels on the ends of the green wings open up as well. What not pictured <clears throat> are the flexible solar panels on the green wings. These will be mounted in between the, the side panel solar panels and the hub solar panels. Um, a battery system will be used for deployment and it has the capacity for a full day, full day worth of power in case of any emergencies. So, obviously solar radiance isn't a big issue since Mars is farther away from Earth. Um, our design needed to maximize the amount of solar energy we could use. To do this, we are landing our design as close to the Martian equator as possible, and we'll be fitting it with higher efficiency solar cells. On the right, you can see data from the Viking lander as it measures solar radiance throughout different seasons. The top, the top graph is the summer season, and the bottom graph is the, the winter season. And the different lines represent different <coughs> states of dust on the solar panels. This slide shows the greenhouse power generation versus power consumption. As you can see, the system is expending around 22.5 kilowatts and generating around 24.8 kilowatts. Keep in mind that not all the systems will be running continually. For instance, the lighting will be on the growth lighting will be on a schedule of 16 on, 8 off, or 12 on, 12 off, depending on the plant. So this number will be smaller on day-to-day -day use. All systems will be controlled from a central control unit mounted in the interior of the main hub. This will allow the astronauts to control light, any necessary environmental controls, as well as aeroponic control systems to make sure the plants are growing as strong as they can. 
For the lighting for the plants, we use LED strings since they can be folded and deployed with the rest of the green room structure. Since this design is already commercially available, this technology has a higher technology readiness level. Finally, the wavelengths for each of these LEDs are customizable and can be optimized for plant growth. And since they're LEDs and can be moved along with the mounting system, it's easy to provide the necessary 70% red and 20% blue light pattern that, lights need, that plants need for growth. And now I'm going to pass it on to Brandon from Test and Verification. All right, we'll start off talking a little bit about our initial risk assessment. So several risks were recognized and assessed during our design process. And the risks that pose the most significant threat to design are shown in this risk assessment matrix here. These include dreaming deployment failure, power system failure, aeroponic system failure, a, uh, environmental system failure, puncture of the green wing, and also plant disease or death. So action was taken during the design process to mitigate all these risks except for the plant disease or death. Since there's a low probability of disease with the current conditions that we have and then uh, plant death rates were already calculated in when uh, planning the planning schedule. So here are some of the actions that we took that were previously discussed to mitigate these risks. So for the power system, we have multiple independent solar panels. This prevents an entire system fa uh, failure since they're independently operated. And uh, just in case we do have issues with the solar system, there are reserve batteries that can take over for a temporary time. Well, with the green wing deployment, we incorporated the uh, independent tension cables to ensure an even deployment. Like we discussed, if one side ends up deploying faster than the other, we can break that cable so the others can catch up. And the constant pressure deployment keeps things as smooth as possible. And the Z-fold packing technique just to prevent Bosch deployments or any unnecessary hang-ups. With the aeroponic system, we have the pH monitoring the, nutrition, the nutrient solution. So we can monitor that as it goes. And if we do have a system failure with the aeroponic system, we have the bladder tank that can be manually released to take over for a temporary period of time while we solve that error. And for the environmental control systems, there are multiple sensors for each wing that are independently monitored to control heat, humidity, and other factors. And if one system fails, then only that one wing will be lost for a temporary time while we fix that issue and the other three will still be functional. And that bladder tank should actually be up under the aeroponic system that I discussed earlier. So in the event of a puncture or a seal leak, each wing has a pressure door that can be independently sealed um, to prevent complete depressurization of the hub and the other wings. And then when the crew arrives, they could assess and possibly fix the seal or puncture. Okay. So after these steps were taken, this is our new risk assessment. This is where we currently stand on our issues. Uh, as you can see, all major failure risks are within the acceptable range currently. Uh, we plan to improve this further through our analog design and tests. So we'll be building both a full-scale non-deployable analog and also a one-fifth scale uh, analog to test all the aspects of deployment. So here's the one-fifth scale model depicted in the image here. Uh, we decided on one-fifth scale because it is a manageable size in regards to both cost and space restrictions, uh, while still being large enough for precise modeling of the deployment system. So we'll be modeling just one deployment green wing and the attachment point um, to the hub. And we plan to have it made with a urethane coated nylon and pressure dynamically similar to the full-scale design and the tension cable system will also be included. So with this analog, we'll be able to test the complete deployment and packing process, and also test cases of both over and under pressurization, and the tension cable deployment systems and run through any issues we have with that. Okay, so moving on to the full-scale analog. Um, the full-scale analog will be non-deployable, be one entire green wing with a section of the central hub to demonstrate system placement. We'll also include a working aeroponic section to grow test plants. And we plan to construct the base structure primarily from wood and um, using other materials where necessary, such in the aeroponics system. So with this analog, we'll be able to test power consumption from the lighting system and the water and nutrient pump systems. And we can also test a complete aeroponic system, including 
testing the necessary wavelengths and refining the lighting system as well. So also included in this model will be environmental control systems, such as heating and humidity control to test. And it will be designed with a rack system to test different plant and light configurations to see which one works best for the different plants. And the general ergonomics of the design will be tested as well just by walking through and performing mock tests and seeing how everything functions. So now I'll pass you back to Jonathan Overton to talk about some of the instrumentation you're doing. So in conjunction with our BAE 3023 instrumentation and controls class, uh, which is taught by Dr. Long, we have three projects that her students will be working on. Uh, so in the first project, students will work on monitoring humidity, temperature, air pressure, and light intensity. They'll be measuring the values in the wing and then printing them back to a graphical interface as well as recording the data so we can review it later. Uh, for the second project, we'll be working on the nutrient solution controls. Uh, so this uh, system will monitor pH and electroconductivity of the recycled nutrient solution as well as the mixing tank and add water and nutrient solution as needed uh, using reserve tanks and solenoid valves. Uh, and then the third project is lighting controls. So in this uh, project, the students will help to automate the control system for the, the uh, day and night cycles of the lights, uh, as well as back checking to make sure that all lights are working properly. And if they're not, send out an alert so that crew members will know uh, that this section of lighting is out. And for further testing on the environmental side, we've began to construct a, a 20 plant test box, just as a basic proof of concept for our aeroponic system as well as to provide kind of a test bed for the instrumentation. So in this we will grow 10 carrots and 10 heads of lettuce. Uh, and you can see we have our SOLIDWORKS rendering on the right and then uh, our construction so far on the bottom left. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you for your time and your attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Um, I just want to suggest did a, a really good job and um, Tracy wasn't able to be here, but I did send him the chart and he took a look at them. He wanted to ask a couple questions. Um, he was wondering about your demonstration in May. Um, he wanted to know if you were planning to build the entire system with each wing or some subset thereof. And um, he also wanted to know um, doing. Um, That's good. You just broke up, Kelly. Can you repeat that? Oh, sorry about that. Is, is this sounding okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so this one was um, about the demonstration. He wanted to know um, if you were planning on building the entire system with each wing for your demonstration in May. Well, and we're going to have just one wing model with both the full scale model, and we'll have the individual systems complete in that wing, and then we'll have a one wing model to model the deployment as well in the small scale version. So it's just going to be one wing model, it's not the entire hub plus four wing system. Okay. And then um, he also wanted to know how you're doing on your budget. Yeah, our budget is actually pretty good because we have we have spent very little so far. So uh, okay. change. You, one, yeah, that'll change pretty quickly. Once we get you know the final go ahead, uh, we are currently within our time and cost schedule, um, but it will depend upon what changes we need, and that, that'll be the next thing that the students will be working on. Uh, just to go back and reiterate, um, on the different projects moving forward, they're gonna, there's going to be one full-scale analog uh, shown on this screen uh, here, which will be a non-deployable analog primarily to test the various systems. <coughs> there will be a deployable scale model analog, and there will also be a smaller architectural analog, which will include the entire hub and all four green wings. And that will be at a smaller scale, I'm guessing probably 1.8 through 1.10 scale model, something along those lines. And then, of course, when there are three projects in the controls and instrumentation course, uh, the uh, BAE students are working on an independent uh, test system just to verify their current control systems uh, at a scale before that goes into the full scale rig. Okay. Um, and then you guys also um, mentioned that you wanted to visit NASA Center, um, and Tracy just wanted to let you know um, whatever you guys decide 
could just let us know if you need any help with um, making the arrangements for that. We'll be, yes, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, anybody else have any questions? Uh, this is Joya. I had a couple, um, and I, I think I may have missed things uh, as well. But I was wondering, how come your um, your green wings are going to be deployed above the ground as opposed to sitting on the ground? Um, well, originally we were looking at deploying them on the ground. Uh, the issue we were running into is the contact with the surface could be somewhat unpredictable. We could land in a rocky area that would pose a threat to our inflatable surface. Um, additionally, if we did land in a rocky area, a flat surface for our central hub would be uh, tilted. And so what these legs allow is they would allow us to level it out. We would still want to get the system as low to the ground as possible, but uh, we do want to have a level system because our aeroponic systems use gravity uh, to feed back um, all the nutrient solution. So being off level is a serious problem. Um, and uh, also with the cast piles, uh, we, uh, we shouldn't have a cantilever beam type problem. It should have a two support system. Um, and with the cables, uh, we no longer have to worry about uh, our deployment rubbing uh, across the ground. And with the high pressure that's gonna be inside these tubes, the, uh, the nine PSI range, uh, they're going to be fairly solid and not much deflection will be seen. So we uh, we kind of weighed out the risks and decided to go with the above ground approach. One of the things we'll be able to investigate with the one-fifth scale deployable model is the impact of ground and obstructions as the systems deploy. So at the end of the project we'll have a much better idea how serious of a consideration that has to be. Well, that all makes excellent sense. Thank you. Um, another question, and, and I think you talked about it, and I think I missed it, but um, the thermal um, control, and I'm just thinking about air movements and albedos, and if you could just talk a little bit more about how you see maybe temperature gradients along these spring rings, or how you're going to control for that. We're, we're hoping to control thermal temperatures through a deployable radiator system. That would be inside the hub and in certain sections along the green wing. And that would all be controlled through a, that center control unit. As you can see, the uh, yeah, through that right there. Um, that would be able to measure all temperature um, in each wing as well as the center hub and then make any necessary changes that needs to. What about circulation? Oh, and for circulation, there's um, some sort of, there'll be a, venti a ventilation system underneath, I think that will allow air to circulate through. Do you have that in the power budget for fans, or how is that going to work? Yes, all the heating power is included in the e systems on the top left. Uh, okay, okay. Um, that, that sounds really great. And one more question, we you're talking about the Norse tank. Um, so what is the, the gas composition? I'm sorry if I missed that as well, but like what percentage are, of are you, CO2, oxygen, nitrogen are you thinking of? This will be uh, just breathable air. So basically what they take up from the National Space Station. Roughly 21% oxygen, 70% uh, nitrogen, and and so how are you planning on getting the carbon dioxide for the plants? Are you going to use that from the Martian atmosphere? I believe that was on a... Okay, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? For, for the plants to photosynthesize, they're going to need, you know, pretty good carbon dioxide levels. So I was wondering, are you going to be taking that out of the Martian atmosphere then, if you're just bringing nitrogen and oxygen in the tank? Um, we did think about that, and I believe we just decided to have some uh, separate tanks of carbon dioxide that would be mixed in. Uh, there's a, um, a system that's included with the that can monitor all the different systems, and so the CO2 levels would just be uh, monitored through that, and then as more carbon dioxide is needed for the plants, it would uh, you know, just kind of open the, open the tank and let more into each wing. <coughs> Okay, yeah, I mean, you might think of, because there is, you know, a fair amount of CO2 on Mars, so the atmosphere is very thin, but, you know, in the future you could look at carbon dioxide capturing mechanisms, maybe, and, and link it in, um, or I don't know if this will be 
you know, linked to a crew habitation where you'll be getting the CO2 from the crew, you know. But that might be something to just think about in your general system to save having to bring it with you. But no, I think this is really excellent. I'm really pleased with your progress and it's, it's a very, very exciting project. So thank you. Thank you. This is Ray. Um, I agree. I think you guys did a great job on concepts and especially some of the materials work that you've uh, looked into. Um, I, I just to follow on to Joya's comment, I mean, you might shoot for a range of like 0.1 to 0.5 kilopascals of carbon dioxide for a, a control set point. That, that's sort of where you want to be for optimal plant uh, photosynthesis. Um, and, and you will have water vapor in there. It could be anywhere from one to two kilopascals of water vapor. Thinking, going back to the, the thermal question, um, if you have heat exchangers, and, and maybe again you covered this and I, I, I missed it, um, obviously that will be a source of condensed water. Um, and and that, that can then be recycled back. I, I suppose that was in your planning. And, just wondering if there's any advantage of having a condenser up high and a, and a reservoir up high to have a, a sort of a gravity feed thing, just sort of a wild thought to ponder. Um, another thing, um, it, it looked like you had fixed plant spacing, and, and I can certainly understand the rationale that for simplicity of doing that. Um, if you are replanting with young seedlings, sprouting things, um, something to consider is maybe, and, and Joy would know more about this, um, is maybe you have selective lighting control where you focus LEDs only right over the seedling and then the in-between open space, you don't um, use any LED lighting until the canopy filled in, so you kind of use a smart lighting approach. Um, there have been other groups um, that have tested this through small business innovative research grants, so just, just another thought to consider there to save some power. Yeah, or alternatively, like you're saying, you could do variable spacing. If, if you have this, you know, very modular system, you could have, you know, trays of, of different or um, aeroponics sections and lighting sections with different spacing depending on plant age and you could just kind of rotate down a bit but yeah it might be hard <laughs> I, I was impressed that where you you proposed using a cation and an anion stock solution and um, that is indeed what kind of drives ph uh, <coughs> balances sort of the balance between cations and anions and, and I've never seen anybody um, kind of propose that approach before and I'm kind of curious to see if you have a chance to check that out in your, in your demonstration. Um, you, you kind of have to get into balancing the, the overall elements along with that but uh, I was just kind of curious about that approach and it was interesting. And then uh, one final comment and uh, uh, you said there's there's pressure locks, which clearly makes sense in case of a, a pressure failure. Uh, when the crew arrives, um, if, if there's a pressure failure in one of the modules, how will they fix it? I mean, will you need a pressure lock type device, or will they have to do an EVA type thing? Just kind of throwing out some I guess if you have pressure locks, it's a lot more mass, obviously, um, and more volume, too, in the system. I think any pressurization failures that would be fixable by the crew would be on the minor scale, maybe just minor sealing issues or where like, the, the clamp wasn't tight enough, something <clears throat> simple to be able to fix the seal with the system. Okay. That's a neat concept. I, I think you guys have done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Hey, yeah, this is Morgan. I, I think the Norse tanks only send up oxygen or nitrogen. I don't think they mix them. So you may need two tanks. But I guess it's possible to mix them. I never thought about that. 
Okay, well, they usually kill just one quantity. Yeah, we'll investigate that. The report I read about him said they brought up breathable air, and it was a combination, but I'll investigate that further so we can uh, get a better yeah. idea of that. And how did you get your force and your end cap? That seems pretty low. Yeah, there was a typo in the report. So it should uh, actually be killing Newtons, not Newtons. Okay. So this is going to be a big challenge. Just a couple of orders of magnitude off. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> We'll send out a corrected slide deck uh, to, to fix that error. But we noticed that just before the presentation. Okay, yeah, I think you, you guys did a great job here on the details you put in. It's really interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything else. All right, thank you, Morgan. Does anybody else have any questions, comments? Okay, um, I just want to say too from Tracy, he wanted to send his congratulations and say that, that he really liked the way you guys used the pictures to show the team and um, the, the very detailed and the graphics that you guys were very helpful. Um, so good job with that. Um, and if you guys have any questions for us, let us know if there's anything we can help you with. Um, but otherwise, great job today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for all your comments. Uh, we're going to be parsing through those after the meeting, and we'll be getting back in touch with you shortly. <clears throat> Thanks for your time and all your efforts. Thank you. Okay, thank you, guys. Thank we you. appreciate you guys um, taking the time out, everybody died and, and your team. And thank you, guys. Um, if, if everybody is good with comments and questions, we'll shut it down. All right. So everyone say thank you at once. Just so we see. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Great job. Yeah, good job. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.